uh, my disclosures. So we're going to talk about what is localized prostate cancer, how do we identify it, and how, in fact, do we make sure it is actually localized. You know, and what are we trying to do? We're trying to minimize harm to our future self or the future patient. We want to find treatable cancers which need treatment, not just to find cancers, but get the ones that actually are going to actually make something different in a person's life. And we know the incidence of uh, metastatic disease has decreased almost 75% since the late 90s when screening and PSA was really brought into uh, favor. So what is localized disease? Well, by the strictest definition, it's within the prostate only and nowhere else. I use the analogy with my patients of an orange. You know, we have a thick rind, the capsule inside the prostate, it's the spongy stuff, that gets, gets the cancer. If it gets on the rind, then it can go anywhere it wants. But that's really not that simple anymore because we have MR imaging, which has a 50% sensitivity of extra capsule extension, so really this early ECE probably has localized disease as well. You know, especially if it's a coin toss, whether or not you're gonna find it on prostatectomy. So I tell my patients, you might have a little unhappy smiley face on your, on your orange. But you know, this is what's disingenuous. Prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease. It's fluid, it's dynamic, but we wanna pigeonhole everything so we have ways to talk about what we're going to, how we're gonna treat, we can talk to other physicians. But again, it's a spectrum. Now the NCCN, and we've seen a lot of this, is sort of showing that these are the different risk categories. It's good, it helps us know we need to dose intensify and what we need to do. However, we also have to realize that organ-confined disease can be in the very high risk groups, but we now need to be extra vigilant to make sure it's not beyond the prostate. We need to make sure there's no extra capsule extension, which is gross, some vesicle invasion, or lymph node involvement, which is gonna predict for failure after prostatectomy. Or if we're doing radiation, I need to know where to dose paint, where to put the extra dose safely to make sure we eradicate cancer. You know, we're talking about genetic markers, is your radiation gonna work or not? My argument is all radiation works if you're given a blade of dose. If I give enough dose, I'll kill anything and everything. But I need to know where to put it, and you need to have the technology and the way to, you know, to do that. So even in the low-risk groups, there is cancer past the prostate. When you get to the high-risk groups, it's a high probability you're gonna find something that's not localized. So what do we do? How do we go look at it? So we go back to the NCCN, unfavorable, high, and very high-risk disease. Yep, you should probably start to do some imaging. And they say bone scans, CT scans, but that's somewhat antiquated, and we're gonna show you that in a second. So what I mean, what are the goals of imaging? Essentially, is when we have to know where the disease is so we can treat it appropriately. This is really important for a radiation oncologists because we dose paint, we give more dose to the tumors, and especially if there's positive lymph nodes. So we know what we're looking for, but how do we find it? And Dr. Crawford showed that everyone has guidelines. I mean, everybody has guidelines nowadays, but you know, I usually look to the NCC, uh, NCCN or the AUA. And it's almost a chicken or an egg thing, right? We need to diagnose cancer. And so what are they saying right now? They say, well, do a DRE. Well, we heard a lot about whether we should do it or not. PSA, biopsy, look for germline mutations because we have markers now and we can different do targeted agents and maybe a family history. I'm gonna to try to argue that, yeah, we should probably do all that stuff, but we need to incorporate MRI imaging before the biopsy, do fusion biopsies, get the clinically significant cancers, and you know, let me know where the cancer actually is. And hell, if you could put markers in at the same time, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> Family history, and then we need to do functional imaging too, especially for the high-risk patients. And this is you know, brought up a lot with the AUA guidelines. Don't screen for men less than 40. 40 to 54, if you're at average risk, you're probably fine. I don't know, I've been doing mine for a while. Higher risk, you know, African Americans, family history, we know all this stuff, but that could be in the back of our mind whether or not we pull the trigger to screen. Greatest benefit, we know 55 to 69, but maybe we shouldn't screen men over 70. That's crazy. You know, this physiological age and chronicological age. There are some folks who are 70, yeah, probably don't have to, but there are some folks who are 80, you probably should, because they get a lot of years left on this earth. You know, the DRE I thought was kind of interesting, so I put this slide in last night. I love this cartoon. Honestly, if there was a virtual prostate exam, don't you think I'd be the first to know? But risk stratification is based on clinical examination. And we know PSA is more accurate, it's objective, and so that's what the AUA recommends. I say, if you're gonna do a DRE, that's a secondary tool. But you know what's interesting? You know, we do a lot of prostate screening, we did, which kind of falling out of favor, but a lot of guys wouldn't come because of the stigma of the exam. They didn't want the DRE. And there's actually some data to support this. 25% of people won't get screened because they don't want that particular manual test. And some guys say it's hurtful. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's just with, you know, the kind of the, the theater of uh, medicine. But if they're not coming in because they're afraid of it, well, maybe we shouldn't do it as much. And honestly, during COVID, we were seeing patients virtually. I used to demand all my physicians did a DRE. It had to be documented. I wanted to see the clinical stage. 
I used to do a um, review for different uh, practices and for different guidelines. And if you didn't have to do a DRE, you got, a, you got dinged, you get a point taken off. But I think, you know, in the virtual world, I think the MRIs are doing a very good job in showing us things that we may not say. It's just folks now occurring saying, don't do the DRE because, you know, it doesn't matter. If you have an MRI, it's going to be more sensitive and more specific. Looking at these 1,683 men, if you did a multiparametric MRI, you were, down, you were upstage 29% of the time. 3% of the time you were downstage. Well, what does that mean? The odds ratio, if you were upstage, led to treatment intensification by 3.5. And if you're upstage, 77% of the time, you had T greater than T3A disease. So now the cancer's past the prostate, we gotta really start thinking about prostatectomies because if you're leaving cancer behind, they're gonna be coming to me for post-op or salvage radiant radiation. You know, bigger field, more toxicity. Did we cure the guy the first time we did him? And of course, the sensitivities are higher with MRI, but even the sensitivities are only 51%. Europeans did something very similar, looking at 180 men, but basically, same story. We upstage clinical T-stage with MRIs, we upstage risk groups with MRIs, and we might even alter our treatment strategies about a third of the time. So <clears throat> if it was me, I want an MRI. I want to know what's going on. So we know what we know, and we know PSA is driving decision-making. It's pretty accurate. It's pretty objective. We know in the PCL trial, which has been talked about a lot over this meeting, if you have an abnormal DRE, but a PSA, which is normal, only 2% of men had treat cancer that really needed treatment. It's useful. It's helpful. But every major trial I'm looking at has been flawed to some degree. But bottom line, it's a great tool. It's what we use, and just use it right. And of course, the higher the PSA, the greater your specificity and your sensitivities. But at the end of the day, 45% of men have organ-confined disease with a PSA of less than four. So I like Dr. Crawford's, you know, sort of let's make it easy, dry line the sand of 1.5. Most of the imaging studies are now using a cutoff of three. And of course, as age goes up, PSA goes up, BPH, prostates get bigger. We know black men and white men can be a little bit different, but this is all on decision-making. There's no absolute. Any ind individuals are, you know, an N of one. Population statistics are helpful. They don't apply to one individual. PSA density has been talked about. It's probably something we should be thinking a little bit more about because it's just another tool, but we can have different cutoffs. You know, the cutoffs are usually 0.15 to 0.2, but having these uh, densities is helpful as we try to bring all the information to the table of whether or not we want to biopsy or kind of further um, the treatment paradigm. And velocity. I like velocity. I treat a lot of young guys. I do a lot of brachytherapy and they want to preserve erections. So I bring guys to the OR in their 40s. And now they're younger than me, which is kind of getting crazy, but it's one of those things where we're watching the PSA jump from 1.5 to 2, 2.5, or from 0.5 to 1, 1 1.5. They're getting a biopsy because, honestly, velocity is kind of predictive of whether or not you have something brewing. Now, we talked about family history and germline mutations, so I'm not going to go through this too much, but now the NCCN has really come to saying you should probably look because not only are you going to help inform what you're seeing, you can help inform family members as well into the future. There's a lot of risk factors which are just not modifiable. Age, I mean, the older we get, the higher probability of harboring a prostate cancer. Race, African Americans have a higher probability. Family history, although not all these cancers are truly uh, hereditary, there is a risk of increased uh, probability of penetrance. And so if we see this, and obviously it's just another decision-making tool. But, you know, we can have all these suspicions, but the gold standard is still pathologic assessment, but we don't want to biopsy everybody, of course. And you've seen this slide from England. And the PSA cutoff of, you know, greater than three, you either had a standard biopsy or you had MR screening. If you had a positive lesion in MRI, that was once that was kicked to the experimental arm. <clears throat> you get an MR targeted biopsy plus a systematic biopsy. If they couldn't see anything, you got no biopsy. You just thrown back into the queue. And as predicted, clinically significant cancers were more if you used an MRI because you were now targeting the lesions and only the lesions that needed to be targeted. You had less clinically insignificant cancers, <clears throat> less by benign biopsies by a lot, and less biopsy procedures. So now you're saving trauma to men and you're saving dollars to healthcare. Well, we can keep going through all these studies. There's another one by Sudeke, but basically the objective was to try to find clinically meaningful cancer greater than four plus three. Second day points with a lower risk, three plus three, the three plus four. A pretty good uh, N, and the exact agreement between the sort of MR fusion biopsy and the um, you know, standard biopsy was 69%, so not bad, 70%. But again, the fusion biopsy diagnosed more, about 30% more, of the Gleason score 4 plus 3s, the ones that actually probably need treatment, and 17% less of the low-grade stuff that we could probably just watch and not worry too, too much about. Now, if you combine them both together, and I like com combinations of radiation oncologists because I really need that map so I know where I'm going. 
But if you put them both together, you can pick up more cases, but many of them are low risk at 83% versus 12 risk of 12% um, into, uh, intermediate 5% high. And of course, uh, we saw the uh, Gutenberg trial yesterday. Same kind of uh, schema, except the schema here is PSA greater than three, MR screening, positive finding, you just got a targeted biopsy. So a little bit different where you were doing a targeted and a saturated, uh, not saturated, but a uh, 12 core biopsy. No MRI finding, no biopsy. So basically we're learning with the MRIs and they have to be read correctly and we have to put the needle in the right location. But basically if we're doing MRIs as opposed to performing systemic biopsies, we're gonna have to read a detection of clinically insignificant cancers, which is actually a good thing to do. But you did come with a small reduction of clinically significant cancers. So again, using all the tools we have. I'm gonna talk about this in my next lecture, but when you have that MRI, you have a lot of anatomical anatomy that really should be looked at when we're counseling patients for anything. Because we know that different anatomical anatomies are gonna be diff more difficult to take out surgically or even more difficult for me to put seeds in if I'm doing brachytherapy or even when I'm doing external beam radiation. So if you're looking for organ-confined disease, then we really should look. And if we're gonna do that, this is where PSMA and PET scans are really coming in. In the nuclear medicine societies, I mean, basically all saying it's appropriate use criteria, especially if you have, you know, kind of higher intermediate or very high risk disease, and if you have CTs of bone scans, which are equivocal. Now, there's no real clear evidence to use this in, you know, low risk patients, but we probably shouldn't be training them anyway. But now multiple studies have shown that PSMA, PET-CT has a moderate sensitivity, but a high specificity. And a lot of it is to go find nodal disease, because if the cancer's outside of the prostate, doing any local treatment without paying attention to the you know, bigger picture becomes problematic if we're not gonna now use different targeted agents and use pelvic radiation fields. <clears throat> this was something that was in the Lancet uh, not too long ago, but really it kind of validated the use of PSMA screening, and basically they looked at 302 patients who were randomly, randomly stratified between PET or bone scan, CT scan. And of course, the PET scan had superior already in sensitivity, 85 versus 38 percent in specificity. And with the PSMA PET scan, you were doing treatment modifications 27 percent of the time, over 5 percent of the time with standard imaging. And the equivocal lesions, which you know, is scratching your head on CT bone scan, where it is oh, now, I got to get an MRI, I got to get some plain films. Well, it took some of that out of the equation. You know, 23 percent if you're using the older technologies, and you know, 7 percent if you're using PSMA. And so, I mean, they really have come to this point where, I mean, at least in my clinical practice, it is superior to bone scan, CT scan. We're using it more and more often, and because we are, we're seeing more and more disease, which we just didn't realize was there before. Now you put these into your cure rates and treatment paradigms, you're realizing that what you thought you were doing before, you really weren't. And so it's really changing everything. So I argue DRE, well, plus, minus, maybe you don't want to scare guys away, but it's still a clinical staging system, PSA, MR fusion, fusion biopsy, germline mutations, family history, and functional imaging. And of course, I didn't put in all the molecular markers, but we've had great lectures this morning. But waiting for a prostate detectomy to determine if the disease is truly localized or confined to the prostate is really simply too late, because now you brought this man down a path where he may not really want to be going. And so I've been saying this, and this is what I'm trying to coin, so we're going to try to say it together at some point, but treatments must be personalized. Everything we're doing with genetic markers and everything else is personalizing treatment to the patient. So I say, we must remember to treat the patient before us and not the patients before them. Thank you.